things over to you, Drew, and uh, let you get started. All right. Very good. Can everybody see me? No. Uh, Amanda. So, Amanda, everything looks all right? Yes, it does. You can see me and you can see my slide. Yep, everybody can see you and uh, the slide, so. Okay, all right. Well, that's gonna be an awesome thing you have in, in April. Doug Tallamy is, is just, just amazing, as is Rick Dark and Heather Holm. I don't know the other person. Um, so I don't, I don't have to say, um, oh, just, just ignore all that stuff, because it's in the same vein of of what I'm going to talk about. In fact, I have a number of Doug Tallamy slides. I know Doug, and I've asked him for um, some of his slides. He was at the Wildflower Association of Michigan conference uh, in uh, 2019. And he put his, and I'm on the board, and he put his um, presentation on my computer. And so, you know, I didn't want to just use his slides without permission, but he gave me permission to use whatever. So you'll see some of his slides with, um, with, with attribution. Um, so that, that'll, be, that'll be an amazing group of people that are, that are coming together. And so um, this, that, that'll, um, this will be a tough act to precede. Um, so um, I'm Drew Lathan from Creating Sustainable Landscapes. I'm a um, native plant landscaper. We only work with native plants. We also do design um, of native landscapes. <clears throat> and um, so we do things like prairie gardens and, and perennial gardens and rain gardens and, and lawn alternatives, um, but we're only using native plants. And I think that'll become pretty clear when I am done why that, that's the case. So um, go like my Facebook page. I'm always posting stuff there or my Instagram. I don't have my Instagram on here. It looks like it, it's Drew Lathan, D-R-E-W-L-A-T-H-I-N, all mushed together. So you can go to my Instagram as well. All right, so um, let's begin. All right, so back in November of 2018, there was an article in the New York Times talking about the insect apocalypse and how um, really the, 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 the huge decline in insects and the, um, the, um, the, 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 the detrimental effects of that. Uh, that was followed up in September, February of 2019, almost two years ago, um, article in The Guardian, uh, same, same me message that um, at the rate that we're going, we could lose insects um, within within a century, and and um, that would be that'd be a very bad thing. Um, in addition, there was an article in September of the same year in the New York Times talking about how over the last fifty years we've lost nearly thirty percent of our birds in North America, and then there was the UN report, um, I don't remember the name of the report, um, that talked about um, we're on the path of extincting, if that's a verb, um, um, a million species of plants and animals uh, in, um, on the planet. So, um, you know, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're losing a lot of our, our species. <clears throat> talked about insects and birds, um, but <clears throat> there, are, there are many other species as well. Um, and, and the main reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, that's my allergies. And even if it weren't, you probably couldn't catch it from me. So the, the causes really, um, the main, the, the, the first level causes are really development in agriculture. And then along with that, the use of, use of pesticides um, and the loss of native plant species and invasive species because of uh, disturbance and, of course, climate change. And now we're starting to understand the, 
impacts of light pollution, and there are others, but the really the, the two main ones are development and agriculture. Um, so greater than more than 55% of the US is city and suburb. So if you look at the US, if you can see my cursor, um, east of the Mississippi River <clears throat> on a nighttime satellite photo, you can get a sense for just how much land we have gobbled up. And of course, on that land is a lot of lawn. Um, and we add a lot every day. We dump a lot of crap on it. Half of those chemicals are, are possible or probable carcinogens. Um, a lot of gasoline and the attendant <clears throat> carbon dioxide pollution. <clears throat> and if that weren't enough, um, on this lawn, we dump 30% of our municipal water. So good, clean water falling out of the sky onto our lawns, onto streets, onto pavement, into the storm sewer, um, into the stream, into the lake. And then we pull that water out of the lake, clean it to drinking water standards, and proceed to throw 30% of it on the ground. It's crazy. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in addition to that, <clears throat> food now claim production now claims half the land's surface. So you, know, you can see over here just just a soybean field, um, and our uh, grasslands are being converted into row crops at rates unseen. Um, since the 1920s, mostly due to ethanol subsidies and crop insurance. And our grasslands, um, we, we only have one tenth of one percent of our original grasslands, and, and we're, we're losing that last little bit. Add to that the problem of invasive species. <clears throat> um, plants brought here for ornamental reasons, for food or by accident, but by far <clears throat> the most common pathway of uh, invasive species into North America is through the horticultural industry. Um, and so as a result, a third of our vegetation are in our natural areas are now invasive species. Um, this is a picture of a healthy open woodlands I took uh, several years ago in the thumbs. You can see it's, it, it's open in there. Um, you don't see, see that shrub layer in there. Um, here's a buckthorn thicket, and um, nothing, nothing can grow underneath a buckthorn thicket. It leaves out early, it drops its leaves late, it shades, and um, pushes out all of the native species. Um, the picture on the left is, is honeysuckle. Um, I took that picture in November a couple of years ago, and you can see it's still green. And that honeysuckle in there... Um, um, greens up very early in the spring, so it shades the woodland floor, which doesn't allow our spring ephemerals to get enough light. Um, they need a lot of light, and they get, and the way they've adapted is by getting that light and, and doing much of their growing in the spring before the trees leaf out. And then, of course, garlic mustard on the, on the right, which puts a chemical in the soil, which prohibits other um, seedlings from germinating. And, and so, so these invasive species, because they don't have any predators, uh, things that eat them or, or diseases, um, can outcompete our native plants for water, water, light, nutrients, and space. And we spend a lot of our tax dollars to control them. Here's a picture of <clears throat> Phragmites. Um, it's the most invasive species, probably the number one invasive species in Michigan. And as a result, there's a near loss, complete loss of biodiversity in this wetland. So um, that's not all. Um, big horticulture, and if you look at the hashtag, go search hashtag big horticulture, it hasn't caught on yet. You just see posts by me. I always put that hashtag on. They, they've introduced alien, uh, in, in addition to being the primary vector of invasive species. They brought um, ornamental species in here that have come with diseases that our native plants don't have any defenses for. So um, 
Japanese chestnut was brought in and all but wiped out the most abundant tree in the Appalachian chain, the, the eastern chestnut. Um, you've all, you all know about Dutch elm disease. Um, dogwood anthracnose is a fungus that came in on Asian dogwoods. Um, you'll know them as Kusa dogwoods. Um, and that, that uh, fungus can be lethal to our native dogwoods pictured here. Um, I don't know why you would want to bring in an Asian uh, dogwood when you have a beautiful understory tree like this that is essentially the same. Um, but, but, but money drives big horticulture. And why would you want to use a native dogwood when you can bring one from Asia? Um, and then sudden oak disease um, came in on foreign nursery stock and um, can kill a, through a wound in the bark, can kill a red oak in, in two to three weeks and then spread via roots to other, other oak trees. So the bottom line is that between 95 and 97 percent of the original U.S. land mass is has been cut, plowed, or paved, 95 to 97%. So if you look out the window, you'll, you'll see um, there, there's almost nothing that is original there. You have to go deep into the woods to find remnants or some remnant prairies, um, or maybe in your, um, in your neighborhood that, that, that huge oak that was clearly there before, you know, was there before European settlement, but most most of the U.S. landmass has been cut, plowed, or paved. So, so that's the definition of the problem. So let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I'm sure everybody here likes birds, um, and um, the question is, what are birds eating in the spring? And they are eating insects, particularly caterpillars. Um, um, because they're the, the, the high protein in them. So, for instance, this chickadee pictured here, <clears throat> in raising its <clears throat> in raising its clutch in the spring, will only go 50 yards for caterpillars. And in those 50 yards, they need between 350 and 570 caterpillars per day. Or when you do the math over 16 days, they need between um, 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars per clutch within a 50-yard radius. Um, and, and so that's just one chickadee nest. So think about two chickadee nests, a robin's nest, a cardinal nest, a wren, um, a nuthatch, and on and on and on and on. Um, these birds need a lot of caterpillars because 96% of our ter terrestrial birds are feeding their young caterpillars. And, and they're feeding them caterpillars because they're, they're, they can be abundant and, and they have a high level of protein. And so um, you get that flush of green, uh, the, the butterflies and moth lays, lays eggs or those eggs have been there since the, the fall and you get this, you, you get a lot of caterpillars. <clears throat> Um, and so not only birds are eating caterpillars, but lots of thing, things are eating insects like, like frogs and salamanders and bats and mice. Even 22% of the diet of a black bear is insects. So lots and lots of things are eating insects. <clears throat> so if we didn't have insects, we would not have um, a lot of biodiversity because insects form the bottom uh, of, of the food chain right above plants. So, um, <clears throat> so we talked about lots of things eating insects and the question is, what do insects eat? Um, they are eating plants for the most part, aside from the mosquito that's biting you um, and, and a couple other things that may take a chunk out of you, but most insects are eating plants. And so, um, um, because there are so many insects, there's more insect biomass than all other animal species combined. 37% uh, of all animal species worldwide are herbivorous insects. <clears throat> so plants can't get up and run away 
from predators. So that they've developed their own defense mechanisms. Things like thorns on roses to keep uh, things, uh, you know, like larger animals from nibbling on them, lignans and grasses to make them unpalatable, and then chemical toxins within their leaves. <clears throat> all done to protect themselves from predation. And chemicals are the most common defense for plants. Bitter tastes, um, um, some, you know, some, some of those, those chemicals are, are actually toxic in them, um, and, and um, tannins to make them um, un, undigestible. Um, so, um, so let me talk a little bit about tastes. Uh, now, let me just go forward. So as an example of that, let's talk about monarchs. Um, and I want to talk about monarchs because it's a very charismatic species and it's in the news a lot because of um, its decline. So there's this relationship between milkweeds and monarchs. Uh, so a um, um, whereas an adult monarch can use the nectar of many plant species, the caterpillars can only eat the leaves of milkweeds. Um, and they can do that even though the, the, um, that sap that, is, um, that exudes from the plant whenever it, it's cut or, or a leaf is broken off um, is a cardiac glycoside. So most things that would chew on a milkweed would have its heart stopped pretty quickly. In fact, if you could get past the taste of milkweed, you'd have your heart and eat enough of it, you'd have your heart stopped as well. But if the cardiac glycoside doesn't get an insect, that sap is very gooey and it gums up the eating parts of animals, making it even more difficult for them to eat, eat the milkweed. So this is, this is a, um, a, uh, um, a, an adaptive mechanism that milkweeds have evolved to, to keep things from eating them. So when you look at this picture of a monarch caterpillar eating a milkweed leaf, you don't see the sap. So the monarch will come out to the petiole over here, if you could see my cursor, um, and snip that petiole that will cut the vessels that supply the sap to the leaf. So even though the, the toxin is still in the leaf, um, the, the sap isn't there where the monarch is eating. So the, the caterpillar is immune to the toxin, but it can get it, its mouth parts gummed up. So this is a behavioral adaptation that the monarch has evolved to be able to get beyond the, the chemical defenses of milkweed. <clears throat> and so the loss of milkweed, and, and so let me go back to this. Um, monarch caterpillars can eat anything, can eat anything other than milkweed species. In Michigan, I think we have 11, it's either seven or 11, species of milkweeds. I think it's 11 spe different species of milkweeds native to our region. And so the loss of milkweed is the prime reason to of decline. Um, between 1999 and 2010, we've lost 58% of our milkweeds and, and that has continued. And, and that's a result again, due to the loss of habitat to development and agriculture. Um, so whereas in now, 25 years ago, we had about a billion monarchs. <clears throat> in 2015, 16, we only had 160 million. And so that's a decline of 84%. Well, like the monarch, 90% of insects are specialists and can only eat a very narrow range of plant. So here's the federally endangered Carner blue butterfly that has an even narrower range of plants. It can only eat one species of lupine or native lupine, Lupinus perennis. No Lupinus perennis means no, means no corn or blue butterfly. And the same goes for those 90% of insects. They're, they specialize on 
a narrow range of plants. So some other examples courtesy of Doug Tallamy is the Hebrew, which will only as a caterpillar eat the leaves of black gum. The fawn sphinx that will only eat ashes. And of course we know what's happened to ashes in our region. The royal walnut moth that um, will only eat the leaves of walnuts and hickories. And the witch hazel dagger moth that will only eat the leaves of witch hazels. And I can go on and on and on. But the point is that, that um, 90 percent of these insects can only eat these uh, eat, eat a very narrow range of plants. So when can they eat a specific plant species? Well, they can do it when they've evolved certain adaptive mechanisms. The first is their ability to find their host plant. If you've ever watched a monarch <clears throat> looking to lay her eggs. You'll see her just flying around and around and around, and then bam, land right on a milkweed. She has very good plant ID skills. The second is the ability to synchronize their life cycle with the appearance of the needed parts of their plant hosts. So you will find in general that as monarchs are migrating north from Mexico, they will not migrate any faster then the milkweeds emerge from the ground um, so that they can lay their plants, lay, lay, their, lay their eggs um, along the migratory route from Mexico up through Texas, through the Southern Plains into the Midwest. The third is physical and behavioral adaptations to eat their hosts. Uh, so uh, the, an example was the, the monarch caterpillar snipping the petiole to be able to stop the flow of the sap and then the digestive enzymes to detoxify those plant chemicals. And these evolutionary processes take thousands of years to occur, which means that insects in our region can generally only eat native plants. Those 90% of insects in our area that have this narrow range of plants evolved with our native plants and can only eat native plants. They cannot eat ornamental plants from other continents. So it's generally the leaves that feed the young. So butterfly bush, <clears throat> um, sold to us by big horticulture as supposedly great for butterflies, does feed a lot of adult butterflies. But being from China, it has chemical defenses in there that um, allow for exactly zero species of caterpillars to feed, uh, to feed on the plant. So it begs the question, why feed the adults when you're starving the kids? Um, imagine this, imagine sitting at the dinner table with your kids or your grandkids with, with and I know these days we can only imagine that, um, but uh, you know, imagine the dinner platters there, you pull the dinner platter up to your plate, you shovel the food onto your plate and you turn to the kids and you say, sorry, you can't eat. And so this is, this is what butterfly, butterfly bush does. Um, it's a beautiful plant, um, but it only feeds adult butterflies and, and feeds zero um, caterpillars. Um, and the reason is because the insects have not had, had enough evolutionary time to adapt to these alien plant defenses. The leaf chemistry is the most difficult defense to, to overcome, and it could take thousands of years. So again, there's a picture of a butterfly bush taking up a lot of space um, that could be used by a native plant to feed the young and the adults as well. Um, here's a picture of an oak tree. Oaks will support more than 500 species of Lepidoptera as caterpillars, Lepidoptera moths and butterflies. Um, oh, there it is. So, oh, okay, so the point I wanted to make is that when you look at this oak tree um, from, from far back, you can see um, it's lush and it's green and it's, and it, and it's very healthy and it, and, and it is. But when you get up close to an oak tree in the middle of the summer, you'll see its leaves are, are eaten and torn and tattered um, because they support more than 500 species of Lepidoptera. Um, and, and, and this is a good sign when you see oak trees like this, no species of plant in our region supports more insect species than oaks, uh, closely followed by birches and poplars. 
and cherries, native cherries, not native, non-native cherries. So when you don't have native plants, you don't have insects. So here's an, a, a list of the usual suspects in our yards. Um, butterfly bush, oh, and I meant to mention about butterfly bush, it is now considered to be an invasive species. But for Scythia, very common plant supports one species of insect, boxwoods, very common species of, a uh, uh, very common plant only supports one species of insect. And we use a lot of English ivy. Um, it supports three and um, it is in, it's, it's also considered to be an invasive species as is myrtle. Compare that to the number of species of insects supported by native plants and, and there's really no, no contest. So Doug Tellamy did a little study on his property. Here's a picture of his, one of his oak trees. And um, he counted at the end of July, the number of species of caterpillars of, on, at just head height. So he walked around this oak tree at just at head height and he found all of these species of caterpillars. And then he went over to his neighbor's yard, which has Radford pears, and he found one caterpillar on it. Um, one. Um, and so those are trees, but the, when you look at berries on shrubs, um, there's a huge nutritional difference. The non-native invasive species like multiflora rose and honeysuckle and buckthorn and autumn autumn and Asian bittersweet, um, don't have a lot of fat in them. They're very high, the berries are very high in sugar. Whereas our native, our native berries have a lot of fat. And that's important because birds need fat for energy to be able to make their migra migrations. So um, huge difference in, in the berry nutrition, nutrition of native versus non-native species. So the bottom line is that native plants produce four times more insect biomass, three times the insect species, 13 times more caterpillar species, and 35 times more caterpillar biomass. Um, that, that's more than non-native species. So that's 3,500% more caterpillar biomass um, produced by native, <clears throat> native plants. So, we use native plants, plants being the only thing that can convert the energy of the sun into biomass, um, which then supports those 90% of insects that can only eat native plants and the 96% of terrestrial bird species that feed their young caterpillars and amphibians as well. And then the things that eat the things that eat the insects. So that heron, may not eat insects, but its food does. So that heron um, is reliant on insects as well. Well, bees are picky eaters as well. So our indigenous bees are four times more likely to take nectar and pollen from native plants. And um, just like uh, Lepidoptera and other insects, 20% <clears throat> of our bees are monoelectric or oligoelectric, which means they take nectar from only one or a few species of plants. So there's a picture of the sunflower bee. Um, we'll only take nectar from our native sunflowers. No native sunflowers means no sunflower bee. Well, and here's the thing. Our native plants can tolerate sub-zero sub temperatures, heat, drought, and insects um, without any or much reduced um, potable water, fertilizer, and spraying. It just drives me crazy when I see people wrapping their, their boxwoods in, in burlap. That plant is not suitable for our, our winters here. Um, so, um, so they support a lot more insects and they can tolerate our climatic extremes because they evolved in our climate. And they can do that because of their root systems. So over here on the far left, um, just for scale, is turf grass with its four inch deep root system. So 
So may, many of our native perennials and grasses have root systems that go down three, five, 10, 15 feet or more in some instances. So here's cylindric blazing star, a plant that only gets to be 18 inches tall, um, but has uh, a 15 foot deep root system. And so that's how they can tolerate drought. So here's a picture uh, in my front yard. Um, and you can see it's been dry because look at the, the little bit of turf that I have left um, turning brown. Um, my, my irrigation system hasn't worked in <clears throat> six or seven years and I have no intention to fix it. But you look at the perennial beds with these deep rooted native plants, they're as green and lush as they can be because they have deep root systems and can go down um, into the soil and get the, the, the water that they need. So the advantages of using native plants in your landscape is the increased habitat from, from native plant to insect to bird to predator. Um, you can reduce or eliminate ongoing inputs such as water and fertilizers. That lowers your water and sewer bills. It, um, you have no chemical bills. And of course, that results in a healthy, healthier living area for you, your kids, your grandkids, your pets, and of course, wildlife. Um, but yet we, big horticulture seems to push on us plants from other continents. And um, I think this happened because um, we became affluent enough so that we could say, why would I landscape with a roadside weed when I can landscape with an exotic plant from China? Um, but to an insect, um, um, although this may not be a typical house, uh, to an insect, this typical landscape um, is a food desert. There is nothing there for it to eat, and so it supports no wildlife. And so big horticulture keeps pushing on us um, these, these non-native plants. You know, you have the Proven Winners brand. You know, they, 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 it, it's like they, they market plants just like everything else. And so, um, so I, I call on people to reject the plants of big horticulture and start using native plants because of the, the, the habitat that they support and the reduced cost and, and the increased sustainability. And, and big horticulture won't talk about the, the, the lack of sustainability, won't talk about sustainability because they're, they're, the plants don't support wildlife and they, they require lots of resource inputs. So our landscapes end up looking like this. Here's a new <clears throat> development that um, was, was forest at one point, probably. Um, there, there's nothing, almost nothing that can live there. Um, they've eliminated the overstory layer, the midstory, the, 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 the shrub layer, and the herbaceous layer. It's, it's just they cut down the forest and rolled out the sod. And so um, it's no wonder that the um, biodiversity is crashing. So one day I'm driving along and I see the sign and I go, wild oak meadows. Look at that, wild oak meadows. There's a big bur oak out in front. It's on wild oak lane. I go in and it's neither. Um, no oaks, no meadows, um, just the usual suspects. There's a Bradford pear. Uh, there are some maples and lawn, lots of lawn. Um, here's a, an overlook in Novi of um, acorn trail and overlook trail. There is not one tree there that produces an acorn, and the overlook is into a mode detention basin. So it, it truly is post-apocalyptic, like that, whatever that word is. You can see here on the right, all the sod laid out, ready to go down. Um, here's Northridge Woods. See the woods? And here's Heritage Woods. Um, it's, 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 you know, they just, just cut down the forest. Um, if you look at the names of of um, developments, you'll find that they're named after what they cut down 
or what they destroyed, um, which leads me to believe that um, all these developers have hired a consulting firm to help them come up with these names, and that firm's name is George Orwell and Associates. Um, so we have landscapes without nature. We've been taught that the only good insect is a dead insect. Um, we're taught to kill insects whenever we see one. We're taught to select plants that are pest free, which is code for plants from other continents that, that have chemical defenses that don't allow anything to eat them. So we now live in landscapes with few insects. So to summarize again, we use native plants because they support those 90% of insects that can only eat natives and the 96% of birds that feed on those insects and up the food chain. And so when we cut down the forest and we landscape with plants that are not native, we drive out the insects, we drive out the birds and the amphibians, and that works its way all the way up the food chain. Um, so that's what happens when, with development in agriculture. So let's talk a little bit about the new way, the, the way out. And so there is a new landscaping paradigm that's emerging, and it talks about nature um, no longer being something apart from us that um, is out there. And we could do whatever we want at home because we have all this, this nature out there. But um, all that nature out there in our natural national parks and our state parks and our city parks are no longer large enough and, and, and clean enough without um, invasive species to support, to support wildlife. So um, as evidenced by the crashes in, 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 in plant and animal species. So the front lines in the battle for nature are now in our backyards and our front yards, um, our right of ways, our schools, our industrial parks. And so we all now become the ecological warriors of the future as gardeners and land managers and teachers. Um, and so our plantings can no longer be just ornamental. Um, they have to do double duty. They, 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 they should be beautiful, but they also have to clean our stormwater and provide for pollinators and serve as that genetic reservoir for diversity. So according to a 19, 2012 study by the USDA Economic Research Service, there are 103 million acres of residential land that is just ripe for turning into what Doug Tallamy calls the homegrown national park. So, um, so in the past, we only chose plants based upon mostly their beauty, beauty, but also screens and a focal point. And so what I'm arguing, what Doug Tallamy argues, is that we need to balance that with, with other things as well. They should still be beautiful, but they should also support food webs and moderate our weather and protect our watersheds. So I'm gonna talk about some principles, mostly in design and management of our native landscapes. Um, so the first principle, I'm, I'm shifting gears. So, so this, is, this is the how-to part, um, or at least the principles of the how-to part. So the first is to match plants to the conditions in which they evolve. We always had sand, loam, and clay, wet and dry, sun and shade, and all combinations of those, and plants inhabited every one of those niches. So the key is to use plants that evolved in the conditions in which they evolved, the soil, the moisture, and the light conditions. So here's a picture of butterfly weed. You can see it's a short plant by the, um, the swallowtail on it. It only gets about 18 inches tall. Look how crappy that soil is, or what what the horticultural trait would call crappy soil. So your your typical landscaper and your typical gardening book would say, if you had soil like that, you need to amend the soil. Well, that's that is that is utter nonsense because look how happy this plant is. So in soil like this, you would use plants that evolved in sand prairies. So this butterfly weed is able to survive in there because it has, even though it's only 18 inches um, tall, it has a five to 10 foot deep tap root that can get at water. Um, 
and whereas the um, butterfly weed um, will do great here, it won't stand a chance here and vice versa. And we sometimes have the opportunity to plant into standing water. And we'll use a plant like this, like pickerel weed or arrowhead or some, some rush. Um, here's the side, the edge of my backyard pond. Um, and this marsh marigold is in mucky water, mucky ground, um, wet all of the time. Um, but it's evolved there. If, it, you, you, if you try to move this plant three feet back, it will die just because it's not wet enough for it. Um, here's um, that backyard pond from that other picture. I was standing here looking towards the pond. Here I'm actually standing on my neighbor's property. And there's the pond. And because I run my sump pump into the pond and it overflows, this area in here um, is wet, has standing water in it 365 days a year. But I'm using plants that like sun and wet soils. So I can, so, so they're very happy in there. So when you match plants to the conditions in which they evolve, <clears throat> you don't need to amend soils. You don't need to change the drainage patterns. And so that results in reduced maintenance and watering needs. You don't have to water that butterfly weed in dry, sandy soil. All right, another principle is planting in masses and drifts. Um, and planting them densely. Uh, I took this picture at the Kresge Foundation in Troy. Um, and so you can see the plants are packed in tight um, and they're in masses, so it's legible. You know, native plants have a, have a reputation for looking weedy, um, but you can see the Baptisia here and the little blue stem and the penstemon and the switchgrass, and it's mirrored on the other side. So this is very dense, which suppresses weeds, um, very legible, and um, not weedy looking at all, very beautiful. Um, here's a planting we did for a client, and you can see the mass of prairie drop seed here, and the mass of, the, of a fern here. And then if I walk up the path to the right, um, there is prairie smoke in, this would have been in May, um, just a mass of it there. So this doesn't look weedy at all um, and is, is very legible. And here is pickerel weed and um, prairie drop seed. This area here is very dry. And this pickerel weed here is actually planted in a pond. And, and you can see you know, the difference in the leaf texture and, and the flower here versus the grass there. Um, very beautiful planting. Um, there's a mass of um, green-headed coneflower. <clears throat> it's in my side yard with um, Minarda and purple coneflower, both plants that evolved in North American prairie. So when you plant masses and drifts, it's easier for an insect to find its host. Um, foraging efficiency increases, cross-pollination increases, the landscape is legible. You can eliminate mulch because when you're planting, putting plants in tight, they're able to compete and um, keep weeds out. So there's less weeding. Now, we wouldn't say no weeding, but much less weeding. And you get the diversity of textures. And so you're building communities of plants that co coexist in nature, which means that, that they generally won't overrun each other. All right, another principle is to layer vegetation. So out in the wild, you have the tree canopy, you have the shrub layer, and the, under, the herbaceous understory. Um, and so, um, when I talked earlier about the more than 500 species of Lepidoptera that eat oaks, 94% um, of them pupate in the soil or in leaf litter. So they drop out of the trees onto the ground. So when you have oak trees and you have lawn underneath them, um, 
it, it, it's not good enough to say that I have an oak and I'm supporting more than 500 species of Lepidoptera um, because 94% of them are being mowed. Um, so instead, you know, here's a river birch with a planting underneath it. So birches are highly productive too. So when the when they drop out of the tree, they have some place to hide and to continue their their life cycle. And so you know, I have that shrub and herbaceous layer underneath that that river birch. Um, here are some woodland gardens underneath oak trees that um, allow for those Lepidoptera to uh, finish their life cycle without getting mowed. So the benefits of layering is you mimic the natural setting. So some wildlife need more than one layer uh, throughout their, their, their life cycle. And um, but the, the hawk that may be up in the tree needs that ground layer so that other wildlife can grow, um, so that it can go, go get a mouse or a songbird or, or whatever. All right, uh, another principle is to limit lawn only to areas that need it. And those, that's defined by place space, pathways to walk, to demarcate boundaries and look neat, to provide a buffer, um, maybe between a neighbor and you, and for a spillover area for entertainment. So here's an area of my house and my neighborhood. And my, um, I live in Novi, which is as sterile and soulless as it comes. And you can see my neighbor's lawn, my neighbor's lawn, my neighbor's lawn, my neighbor with 3.9 acres. Um, he has somebody come mow it. It takes four hours to mow it. Here's my neighbor with lawn, but here's my house. So here's a perennial bed in the front. Here's a rain garden. Here's a rain garden, perennial bed, perennial bed, perennial bed. And I only have pathways for, for walking to make it look organized in a pathway here around it between the sidewalk and the perennial bed. I have a little more, there's my pond in that area I showed you around it. Um, I have a little more, and there's my vegetable garden, I have a little more lawn back here because our patio is not quite big enough um, to entertain. And just this year, I pulled, or last year, I pulled this perennial bed out to about here to get rid of some more lawn. Um, there's my neighbor's yard um, with um, a couple really, really gnarly, ugly perennial beds in it that he pays no attention to. And there's my front yard. And you, again, you can see the, 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 the buffer here of lawn and the pathway. And this is buffalo grass, a, um, a little patch of buffalo grass lawn there that I have. Um, again, you can see this is from the side. There's my perennial bed, uh, rain garden, perennial bed, perennial bed, just pathways of lawn through there. Um, this is a client we did. This is the only lawn. Um, this is a new house. This is the only lawn. This is in Rochester Hills. Um, and, and the rest were just perennial beds. Um, another principle is to provide a continuous succession of flowering plants through the growing season. Uh, people like to see color. Um, it provides for pollinators and it makes the, the planting dynamic as the as color comes and goes and the color moves around throughout the growing season. So here's a lawn extension we did for somebody. Um, this is in Northville. And um, this is um, Harry Beard Tongue. And this would be a May picture. Here it is in July with butterfly weed coming in. And there it is in September with um, Black Eyed Susan. So I'll go back May, July, and September. So we have color across the growing season and um, pollinators love that and, and the neighborhood loves it as well. Um, here is um, a property, this is the one in, in Rochester Hills. You can see this vantage point with the butterfly weed and the yarrow. This would be uh, late June, early July. 
and there it is a little bit later. The, the yarrow, there's still a little bit of yarrow, but the butterfly weed isn't showing, but the echinacea and the retibita is. Um, another principle is formal in the front, wild in the back. Um, helps, helps with the community. Um, so I, I wouldn't call this wild. This is formal. The plants are in masses and drifts. They're demarcated. Um, it's in front of my house, but there's back behind my house. And this prairie I planted is actually on my neighbor's property. Um, I asked them, you know, I said, asked them, I said, you know, why don't you just stop mowing 2,000 square feet here and let me put a prairie in. They said, go for it. So it's, it's out and back. Um, this is the house in, that I showed earlier. This is in Bloomfield Hills. And so a lot of lawn in Bloomfield Hills and everything has to be just so, um, but there's no lawn in this new house. Um, but we just made it really formal in front with one species of a short prairie grass. But in the back, it's, it's just wild, um, completely intermixed. There are some more pictures of it. Um, wild in large spaces, um, you know, like around a detention basin. This is um, the Delta Dental Facility in Okemos. This is the Chicago Botanic Garden. This is the House of the President of Bowling Green State University. Um, this is a wild space in Northeastern Ohio. And then don't forget about grasses and sedges. The great thing about them is that they look the same in the winter as they do in the summer. They're just not green. So they're a great structural plant for the, uh, for the winter as well as in the summer. There's a little blue stem um, at the, um, yes, yeah, someplace. Um, there's some little blue stem at my house in the fall. You can see it's turned brown in the fall. Um, with the backlit, with the great white seed heads on it. And there it is in the winter. I mean, it looks the same, it's just brown. And so you get that structure in the summer that, that uh, flowering perennials can't necessarily provide. Um, here's my prairie drop seed along the side of my driveway in September. In November with the dew on it. And in December with hoar frost on it. So just um lots of lots of interest across the growing season you've seen that picture there's there's a lawn extension just done with a bunch with three different kinds of prairie grasses bioswale with three sedges in it um, so the next principle is to use cues to demonstrate intentionality um, so things like signs for this rain garden rocks or grass, cairns, uh, sculpture, and things like walls, hedges, and, and fences, just to make it look like that um, this is an intentional planting. So let's talk about management. Um, when you have dense drifts and masses, um, you have less weeding. When you have the right plant in the right place, no, no supplemental water. And then you just edit to preserve legibility. And so, Things will want to move around. Seeds drop, they'll end up someplace. So something that grows over here, you may consider the weed over there. Another principle is leave the leaves. Um, there are many species of Lepidoptera that overwinter in leaf litter. Um, as, some as eggs, some as caterpillars, and some even as adults. So the leaves provide shelter. So that that I think that's a comma butterfly. It overwinters in leaf litter. Um, so if you rake your leaves, um, you're, you're throwing away those guys. And in your beds, anything that can't come up through three or four inches of leaves doesn't deserve to live anyway. Um, you can go out into the woods and these little dainty ephemerals, they come up through all that leaf litter um, and nobody's raking the woods. Um, so there's a luna moth in the leaves. There's it as an adult. So if you shred or chop them up or get rid of them, say goodbye to that guy. Amanda, how are we doing on time? I need some more time. 
take as much time as you want. Um, if anybody has to go, I, we hate to see it, but yeah. they're free to go. But keep going, buddy. I, I, you know, last last winter I had most of my presentations cut off. I haven't done this presentation in about eight months, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm blabbing a bit. Um, I need another fifteen minutes. So um, the next principle of maintenance is don't cut your plants down in the fall. It provides shelter in hollow stems. Things will go burrow into hollow stems to um, overwinter. Uh, seeds are an important source of food. You can see over here that the goldfinches have been eating the echinacea, and it provides some winter interest. You know, with you can see the seed heads of the uh, the allium here and and the other things as well. Um, but in the spring, only cut your stems to 15 inches because in those hollow stems, bees will go lay their eggs and um, cut it down to the ground and, and the bees can't do that. So here's a free bee house. And so, um, so there's a free bee house. Um, when you cut, just drop the material. Um, it adds nutrients to the soil and the plants come up around it very quickly thereafter and, and hide that. And of course, never any pesticides, little to no watering, no fertilizing, no mulching. And then the last thing is um, no motion to use motion detector lights outside. Um, lights serve a purpose for security, um, but we're, we're finding out that um, most birds migrate at night in the spring and the fall and lights um, uh, throw them off. And so um, don't, don't run your lights <clears throat> all night. Put them on motion detectors and save some electricity. And of course, you know, we've all seen all those moths around, around the outdoor nighttime light um, and, and they'll all be dead in the morning. All right, so let me share some pictures <coughs> of what's shown up in my, <coughs> excuse me, in my yard on my quarter acre in my sterile solar suburb. So there's a bumblebee bee on Minarda. There's one on um, swamp milkweed and there's a milkweed beetle down there as well um, on echinacea. <clears throat> this is bottle gentian, uh, G-E-N-T-I-A-N, bottle, like a, like a bottle that you drink from, bottle gentian. It's in my front yard rain garden. I mean, as a closed flower and only our native bumblebees are strong enough to open it, to pollinate it and get nectar. So every sunny September afternoon, this is what's going on. Gulp. So pretty cool. <clears throat> Here is New England Aster in October and look at all of the bees on it. And this is beekeeping. Um, using native plants where native bees are more likely to be able to use them in non-native bees. Um, good beekeeping is not having a hive of an invasive European species of bee um, in, in your backyard that um, transmits diseases to our native bees. Um, and while I was there, that guy showed up. So this is in October. Here's a great black wasp on swamp milkweed. So there's always entertainment value in my yard. And there's a milkweed beetle there too, right there. And because I have a pond, I'm raising dragonflies and damselflies. Here's a, 
is a clear wing hummingbird moth on my swamp milkweed. That is a moth. <clears throat> I will sometimes just go out and walk around <clears throat> to see what I can find and I'll, sh and I'll come back inside an hour later. On the left is a um, spice bush swallowtail caterpillar eating the leaves of my spice bush and I believe that is an adult spice bush swallowtail on the right. If it's not, it's a um, it's a um, different swallowtail that uses golden alexanders for its host plant. And of course, I'm raising monarchs as caterpillars and adults. Um, Blazing Star in September is a monarch magnet because the monarchs need to fuel up for their long migration. Couldn't get a good video of all of the monarchs just sort of circling around me. And of course, bees as well. Um, and then other kinds of things. Um, milkweed support about 36 species of insects. Here's a tussock caterpillar of a tussock moth. Here's a species of milkweed beetle and another species of milkweed beetle. Um, I don't know what that is on my spice bush, nor I don't know what that is on my monarda. There's a cicada on little blue stem. And then because I have a pond, um, water is very, very productive. There's a male American toad making a lot of noise looking for a mate. And when he does that, you get toad porn. And when that happens, you get babies. Um, but the green frog showed up as well, just showed up. And they're reproducing in the pond as well. Um, there's a ruby-throated hummingbird on my cardinal flower in my front yard rain garden, morning dove coming for a drink, had a great blue heron show up one day. Goldfinches on the left on columbine eating the seeds and on rosin weed on the right eating the seeds. Robin coming for a bath. A um, Nashville warbler with a caterpillar. I didn't know there was a caterpillar in its mouth until I blew up the picture. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Duck have been coming for five years um, in, into the pond. And there is a robin eating the berries of red twig dogwood. Um, so normally if there's a group in the room, I ask, what eats songbirds? Oh, not ready for that yet, sorry. Um, also had a... Um, Female belted kingfisher can grab one of the goldfish out of my pond. Good riddance, they're no more. They, they beat, they've cleaned them out. Um, now, um, oh, and, and in the winter, uh, because I leave my plants up and they're dropping lots of seeds, um, there are the, um, there, there's, there's a lot of birds out there. You can maybe almost see the black tinge on the snow of the leaves. So I have a lot of birds in the winter. This is my winter bird feeder. I don't need to have a go to Wild Birds Unlimited, spew carbon dioxide out my tailpipe to get there, spend money on a bird feeder. I have a bird feeder. Um, and then what eats songbirds is Cooper's hawks. So I regularly have Cooper's hawks around. Um, I, I watch them hunt. Um, I also have a brush pile. Um, who knows what lives in there? Um, but um, 
that um, stuff, you know, things, things like um, opossums. Opossums are great little animals. They, they eat thousands of ticks a year, um, which makes them beneficial for human health. Um, they're the only North American marsupial, and they're cuter than all get out. Um, so it could be raccoons around. And because of that, I have regularly have coyotes, and I regularly have to pick up coyote poop in my yard. We hear them at night. So if insects were, were to disappear, um, most flowering plants would go extinct because um, they need insects for pollination. Food webs um, would crash um, because without, without insects, there, there would be no birds and, and up the food chain and humanity would be doomed. Um, so you can start by ripping everything out and starting all over with natives and I highly recommend that. Um, but it's expensive and time consuming. So you may want to scale that out, scale that back a bit. Um, so you could take out a little lawn every year and add a perennial bed or a rain garden. You know, if you, if, if you have lawn that you're not walking on, using as a border, not using for entertainment, it's just wasted space. You can flip a perennial bed. Um, and at the other end of the extreme, anything that dies, just replace it with a native plant and you'll be moving forward. Um, so one of Doug Tallamy's graduate students did a study in DC and found that compared to native landscapes, <clears throat> yards dominated by introduced plants produce 75% fewer caterpillars, were 60% less likely to have bleeding chickadees, had fewer eggs, the nests were less likely to survive, they had fewer fl fledglings and delayed maturation. So there's this Native American proverb that says um, that the land is not ours. Um, it's our children's land and we borrow it from them. And they, they say that because they want to um, return the land in better condition than when they found that. And I think all of us live by that ethic. If you borrow a tool from a neighbor and it needs some oiling, We'll oil it before we bring it back to our neighbor. And so, um, the, 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 you know, translated to today, the, the, the land around us is not ours, it's our children's land. We're starting to understand that with climate change. You know, many of us won't see the, um, the, the, the really bad effects of that, but our children and grandchildren will. And so we want to leave the earth better for them. And um, in, in one, in one way, it's very easy to do, and that's by turning your, your yard into a homegrown national park by using native plants and supporting more insects and the food chain. So that is it. <clears throat> Amanda, if, we, if you want to entertain, I'm happy to entertain some questions from people. For those of you that have questions, feel free to unmute yourself right now or also feel free to use the chat function. Um, I did already have one question come through from somebody. They're inquiring about deer and what you recommend to plant when you have a lot of deer. They said that deer have eaten everything of theirs except for the invas invasive plants, of course. So do you have any recommendations on that front? Uh, you know, um, if they're hungry enough, they'll, they'll eat your shoes that you leave on the front porch. Um, there are some plants that are pretty um, deer resistant, mints, plants in the mint family, um, plants in the um, onion family, uh, plants with strong smells, um, but it's very, it, it, it's, it's very variable. Um, um, you know, people people say, "Oh yeah, deer just decimate my my coneflowers, and and the deer won't touch mine." Um, and and I have I have I have enough deer here. Um, the rabbits um, just decimated my woodland flocks in one part of my yard and wouldn't touch it twenty feet away. So um, trial and error. 
Um, they won't eat grasses for the most part or sedges um, and plants with strong smells. And we had somebody inquiring if it's possible to get a, a list of some of the native plants that you showed to us today. Is that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody's wondering if if you can if you have a list of some of the native plants that were in your slides today. I know that's. Oh, there were probably more than a hundred different species in the slides I showed today. Um, just you know, if you go to my website, I think I have a list of native plants. But you can go to any native plant nurseries website and get a good list of native plants and it will have height and color and time of bloom and the type of you know how much sun it likes um the moisture requirement type of soil and so on um i, I imagine most of you you know there's a garden club um are pretty sophisticated you, you you probably have um pretty pretty good skills in looking at a plant catalog, um, seeing the plant's requirements and knowing your plant, your, your, your yard, and just matching the plant to that, to the conditions you have. And then we also had a question from Barb. She wants to know what your thoughts on gypsy moths are. I'm sorry, I missed the second part. I'm getting old <laughs> and hard of hearing. That's all right. Um, what are your thoughts on gypsy moths? Um, gypsy moths. Um, I don't know. Gypsy moths aren't native, are they? I don't think so. Um, they, but they, you know, they'll defoliate a tree one year, um, but they, they generally don't kill trees. Um, I wouldn't spray for them because you're killing everything else as well. Um, you can try to knock down their, 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 you know, their their webs and their cocoons and so on. You could try to do that um, mechanically. Um, I, and I get that, you know, 50 feet up in the air, that's difficult to do. So you may not be able to do that. Next question. Yeah, does anybody else have any questions that they wanted to uh, chime in with? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have anything that you wanted to say. Um, if you have any problems, feel free to use chat as well. Cool. So if you go to um, my web page, um, there will be a link there to my YouTube page. And there is the one hour version, which this is supposed to be the one hour version of this talk as a video, if you want to go back to it again. And I just wanted to thank you again for presenting for us tonight. A wonderful presentation. And I think I was telling you before, I love some of the pictures of some of the projects you've worked on. I wish you could, well, I wish you was a Ford, for you to come to our houses too. They're so, so wonderful. You're welcome. Happy to, happy to do it. And uh, unless anybody else had any other, other questions, we'll probably call it an evening. Um, Thanks again, Drew, for, for speaking with us and getting a lot of comments coming through. Just thanking you for your time and the excellent presentation. So You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. All right. And with that, I'll say good night to everybody, and we'll see you next month. Good night. Amanda, stay on for a moment. I will. I'll, I'll be here till everybody's off. So. Okay. Um, so I could see a lot of people came.